time. We have, uh, I think we have about 25, 25 minutes for uh, questions, discussion. Go ahead. Uh, Ron, go ahead. David, in your history of the world, <laughs> did you ever notice that in all the other examples that one might throw out there on mandatory mediation or arbitration, including for public employees, you got, rather than a simple draw in the sand line of a date, some tribunal, some board, some fact-finding person has to determine that the parties are at impasse first. So that they have to make a real effort to actually try to negotiate before they go into mediation, instead of just sitting around waiting for 60 or 90 days to go by. Ron's question, if I can rephrase it. <laughs> what trigger? What trigger should there be to allow the union or the employer to force it to mandatory arbitration? So Ron's question is, should it be a, a finding of impasse? Well, there are various triggers you can use. One is a finding of impasse. The other is the party just go beyond a certain date. But this statute actually has a trigger because it says the parties have to make some kind of effort to get a contract. So the employer can always defend by saying the union sat by, didn't do anything, didn't bargain in good faith, didn't do anything, just waited for the time period to elapse, and then demanded ma mandatory mediation. So there is a trigger. There is sort of a finding that has to be made. I agree it's a relatively low bar. But for the cases that Rob has talked about, there is a finding necessary of an unfair labor practice that is, the employer had to have committed an unfair labor practice. The certification was before 2003, before you can invoke mm -hmm. mandatory mediation. And I, I will say I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense, because the unfair labor practices don't always have to have to do with bargaining. But to answer your question, you know, I, I understand there has to be some trigger, otherwise there's no incentive on the part of the union to negotiate, or the employer to sit back and wait for the time period. But, Honestly, the public employee laws we have in this state covering city and county, government employees, even in San Francisco, when I've adopted mandatory binding, not all of them are binding, uh, mediation slash arbitration still has to have it triggered by finding the impasse. <laughs> Getting the impasse in those circumstances isn't difficult because it's not hard for the employer or the union to dig in its heels and simply say, we're not moving, we're at impasse. But the problem is, some of these statutes have baseball arbitration, which partially solves the problem, because then what baseball arbitration is, is you, your last offer is put on the table, and the other side's last offer, and the arbitrator has to choose which is the best one. So the, the effect of that baseball arbitration is to force both parties to mediate or moderate their positions, knowing that some third party is going to pick and choose the best one. So would you you'd be for a baseball arbitration amendment to the... I mean, once I said baseball, you'd chirp in. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't try to uh, divert uh, the importance of the attention from my question. Right. And the, the, all right, am I for baseball arbitration? The times I've done... The agricultural labor relations plan. Uh, the times I've done baseball arbitration in this kind of context, I thought it works. And I, I think the fact is, that both the union employer have to get sensible and put something on the table that works. Um, unions are afraid of it because then they have to go back to membership and explain why they're putting something on the table that appears to be less than what the membership wants. And I think management has the same problem of explaining yeah. to themselves why you're having to give in and coming close to the other side knowing that that arbitrator is going to figure out what is the most reasonable position. So I think baseball arbitration works. Also, the, the industries that Ron's talking about are safety sensitive for the most part, but you could probably make the same <coughs> argument in agriculture as well because it's perishable. It's perishable, come on, got to come out of the field at certain timing issues and all that. So it makes sense. <coughs> Can I comment on something you said, Bill? Yes, go ahead. Right. Right. And this is something Letitia said that is. Bill, Bill said, let's go back to Salas. Salas is a case where a worker gets fired and claims that he was discriminated against on account of a disability. And at the time he's fired, the company has no reason to believe that he's unauthorized to work, undocumented. And during the course of the litigation, they come up with some evidence. It's not conclusive that he may be undocumented. And they say, okay, you're undocumented, at least we think you are. And the trial court finds that he was unauthorized to work and dismisses the case. 
the California Supreme Court says um, there isn't enough factual evidence here to establish he was undocumented to put that issue aside. They said this is what we call after acquired evidence. And they said there's nothing in conflict with the immigration laws to say that Mr. Salas gets back pay between the time he got fired or other remedies and when the company can actually prove that he was undocumented. Because the court recognized that it lacks the power to order him reinstated when he's undocumented. Now, where I disagree with, with Bill is that I see that what the court seems to me to have said, and this has to do with your suggestion, Leticia, that it wasn't unlawful for the employer to hire and retain Mr. Salas because the employer really didn't know that he was undocumented. It's unlawful under her to retain the worker when it knows he's undocumented. And the worker really didn't do anything wrong because there was no evidence that he used false papers because of that when the Supreme Court interpreted our immigration laws, it's not unlawful to work when you're undocumented, it's just unlawful to use false papers. So they said, ordering, giving him bad pay is not inconsistent with the federal statute, it's not preempted. Having said that, the Ag Board could adopt a rule that says, we will not, under any circumstances, allow the issue of status to be litigated. So that if, and this is a warning to employer lawyers, Ron, that in the course of a trial, you can't ask the worker, what is your status? That's the current state. No, wait, the but, but what happens if you come in with some other evidence, you have other evidence that you produce from another source to prove that the worker was undocumented? Because the, the National Labor Relations Board takes the same position generally, that you can't just fish and say, well, Ron, to the witness, are you undocumented? The employer can only raise it if they come up with a fairly substantial case that the worker's undocumented. So if the Ag Board says, we as a matter of law will not allow that inquiry under any circumstances, which then would allow the Ag Board theoretically to reinstate somebody or to reinstate because there'd be no evidence that the worker was undocumented. Now, I'll just add that the Labor Code was amended um, January 2014 to make it unlawful for employers to retaliate against workers because of immigration status, which is the same kind of thing that the Ag Act had. But it's got another provision that says lawyers can lose their licenses, as you know, for threatening employees with retaliation. So I, I take the position that statute means that managed lawyers can't ask people about immigration status in deposition or ad board hearings. So beware. And David, that, that, statute, that statute was passed because of the new driver's license, as you know. It's been ARB policy for years to be completely neutral on that, not to allow any questions about safety status, period. So maybe you're looking at the LRB. LRB, we've had that situation for years already. And we do it. You, do you ever understand that? Hell no. No, you don't actually. Ask anyway, when ask it, we don't even get, I won't even mention a case that I was just in recently. We couldn't even get within 500 yards of the question. Like yeah, that. Exactly. Well, the, the problem so, is there is one major lawyer who's done that. Yes, so the, the statute that you're talking about, the, the attorney statute was actually based on attorneys who were representing growers who were asking questions, who were either asking questions in deposition or using the information that they had gotten in discovery to turn over to immigration authorities. Yes. And it was the legislature... We're talking about the ARB. Right. No, I know, but but the, I'm, I'm responding to the 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 retaliate the anti-retaliation statute. And can I have a question? Just which of these folks would you have stationed at the border if we're going to start getting into immigration law under the ALRA? I don't know that I don't know that it's a question of having anybody at the border or talking even about border enforcement, right? There are two purposes to immigration to the immigration statute, which is what I started with, and one of them is humanitarian purpose, and the other one is a border enforcement purpose. There are there are parts of the immigration statute that Congress passed that said we have to cooperate with local uh, or federal or state authorities in order to accomplish our purpose in immigration law. One of those is the U visa, right? Which cannot go anywhere without state or local or federal and, uh, agency uh, participation, right? So all I'm doing is saying the, immig the immigration statute itself provides for that kind of participation by a state agency like the ARD. And I understand your proposition about the parole. But actually, 
actually starting to man up the ALRB with the Immigration Council. I'm, I'm questioning that because it's already tough enough for them to get enough budget to get enough labor attorneys. Uh, I'm just wondering where the funds are going to come from for immigration attorneys when deferral to Homeland Security will do the job just as well. Well, it actually won't in those particular situations, and I probably I agree with you. Yeah, there's going to be have there's going to have to be budgetary issues in. in We're trying to get <laughs> What's that? Yeah, we're just one yeah, friend. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Rob, uh, just so I'm clear, what cases are now in the Court of Appeal on this mediation and arbitration issue? Uh, well, we just had the uh, arguments for Peral, and that's headed there. <coughs> the San Joaquin tomato case that I made reference to is really there on a, a, sort of a Mako issue, but it's something that's related to another case that, that Mario mentioned earlier and that I can't really talk about. But essentially, uh, you know, hopefully all these matters get resolved, you know, without having to go to the courts. But uh, those, th those are the only two that are actually out there because David, uh, uh, opposed by one of our previous partners, Scott and I used to be partners at Littler uh, before it became a thousand lawyers and global. Um, but but I'm not exactly sure that you or I would have handled the case exactly as Randy did, opposing David, although I understand why he did it that way. But uh, it's out there, and it's it's pretty well established, at least the constitutionality of this, of this approach. What's not been decided yet, and I can't really go into it uh, in front of the board folks. We, I, was, I also mentioned that when we do this next year, we'll just have noise canceling headphones for the chairman and, and the members. So when we want to fight, you know, Mario wants to take me on, we'll just put those headphones on them, and then once we're finished, we'll give them a signal to take them off. But it's an interesting issue. You're, you're actually you're tougher to beat down without the ponytail. <laughs> But uh, you know the, the issue really is it's it's interesting because with these certifications that have whiskers on them from 1975 1977, there's nobody else around. There's one of those where there was no bad faith bargaining charge ever filed. So this case that's pending is about whether or not there was a valid disclaimer as opposed to abandonment. But let's say uh, you have to uh, also now participate in embassy because. There's been a new demand 31 years later that you go back to the bargaining table, even though you know, nobody's left from 1977 to 81. And the question is, are you making a special appearance to contest jurisdiction because you don't think your client has a duty to bargain anyway? And all that stuff may end up there as well because it's all cases of first impression. But I have to say you know, that with the current uh, uh, makeup of the board and as much experience as uh, the chairman has uh, having uh, uh, been very informed in the national uh, statute uh, precedence as well. That it'll all get handled the right way, but you know it's it's very interesting. How do you? Yeah, I had a, an observation. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit, David. I, everyone knows I disagree with Rob and Ron, but <laughs> <laughs> on the on the MMC, I, I don't think you could point to the absence of numbers as a as a as a basis to say it's had limited. Effectiveness. We our experience is because there's MNC, other employers do actually agree to a contract without even having to get into that process. And we have an employer that uh, hated us more than the fruit grower in the in the valley. This was a, a, a Salinas Valley employer who fought us for 30 years. And after the first contract, which was part of the MNC process. Actually, you know, looked at the union president and said, "You guys aren't as bad as I thought you were going to be." <laughs> and they were able to sign a second contract. So, without going into MMC at all, obviously, for that second contract. So, I think there are examples to, to point to that just because you're not filing requests for MMCs, you you know, it, it is working. Yeah. And I'll, I'll agree. In, in the House Winery case, and Pete is here to confirm this, but. After this big fight and this make hole and they paid a lot of money, um, they changed counsel and management, and we've now negotiated how many contracts since then? Two or one. <coughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> and um, not you. And anyway, they changed, and now we've had a very reasonably successful relationship with them. And I, you know, I, we, without MMC, we would never have gotten here without the make hole. 
Well, and also to your point, Mario, not that you, I want to really agree with you too often, but there's this, um, what Charlie Morris used to talk about, Mr. Chairman, the radiation effect of actual settlements. And so I think to his point, it's kind of the radiation effect of MMC in a way, because they see what the, where, where this is going, especially once you look at these factors, you know, the party stipulation, the financial condition of the employer, corresponding wages, benefits, other terms, and other collective bargaining agreements, consumer price index, all those things that the mandatory mediator and the, ultimately the board are supposed to pass judgment on, to say, you know what, it might be better to, to negotiate this and get it done and not have to spend as much money on Ron, you know, as expensive as he is, uh, to, uh, to defend you. <laughs> I learned deflection from Victor Van Gork. So it really, it, really, it really makes sense. And then it, it gets me back to the other point I want to make from Dr. Martin's presentation this morning uh, is, you know, with the minimum wage going to $10 and these averages 11 or 12 you know, we have clients that were having trouble getting workers because there were, you know, labor contractors that were paying more and they were running, you know, as, as good folks do, they want to make the, get the best bank for their time. And so, you know, all of this process is leading ineluctably to uh, better wages all the way around, even though I get the point about, the, you know, the cost of living kind of eating up the difference. So, anyway. Um, there so there was one other factor Marta didn't mention. Wait, wait, she had a question. Yes, hi, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Salcedo for your excellent points. Uh, I'm the general counsel. Uh, and your presentation is actually very timely because just yesterday I issued a policy and procedure memo on the importance of immigration issues and our ability to use, uh, to certify your visa. Um, oh, excellent. Yes, yeah, so congratulations. You just provided a, an additional training for all of my staff that is here, so thank you for that as well. <laughs> but I agree that it's, it's very um, important for us to look at the humanitarian aspect of the people that we're here to serve. And we can't just send them to I, uh, INS or ICE um, or give them an I, a 1 800 number. I mean, that's one of the things that we teach uh, within the agency. We've got to be able to work very closely with the workers to make sure that we provide them the services that they need and deserve. Um, so, one of the things that we uh, that I included in my in my memo was actually a need to uh, develop close relationships with immigration agencies or immigration attorneys. Uh, we are certainly understaffed, but that doesn't mean that we can't provide that service or uh, create those relationships. So I'm certainly very interested in hearing from you any relationship that you think that uh, we should be working closely with, or partnerships that we can make so that we can make sure that we service everybody, even with the very limited staff that we have. Um, I am very sorry that uh, the representative from the agency is actually not here right now, who was here all morning, to have heard this. Uh, so that I could, in my ongoing request for more money for our agency and staff, uh, have some support. Um, I'm happy to help you lobby for that. Um, on the immigration question, we have actually had uh, immigration attorneys raise immigration status during the hearings, and it's very problematic, and I have a wonderful team who do uh, object very aggressively on this point. But I was wondering, are there any agencies that have certified U visas for those workers where a council have raised that issue during a hearing. Um, yeah, and I can give you examples from the NLRB. So I actually uh, worked with a group of uh, a nonprofit organization that was uh, 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 looking for a U visa certification from the NLRB, and I wrote a letter on their behalf. So. That letter has all the list of the NLRB cases um, in which uh, the NLRB uh, found retaliation, um, for found that it was retaliation, and then it was using that as the basis for uh, visa certification. So I can send you those offline. The board just uh, a couple of weeks ago held that uh, outstanding Hoffman uh, conditional reinstatement, that is to say, the presentation of papers within a reasonable period of time is a permissible run, run it under the National Labor Relations Act, so-called conditional state. Yeah, the, I think... Uh, the most, the uh, case that's bounced around uh, for years, the... Uh, it's a national board case. Yeah, the National Labor Relations Board. Yeah. The, uh, met, the, the, the Mizzotos Navin Bakery decided by the board on March 27 of this year, 362, 
NLRB number 41. Randy Chu. Yeah, I was just going to raise it, Mario, having done one of those cases with the UFW short of going to mediation. There's a big difference between Dylan with Armando and his wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll pass along the message. <laughs> I know Rob agrees with me. I totally. That. In fact, they have the Amaral settlement was worked out by the Lupe. Just keep them on. All right. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, all.